Hello, everyone. Welcome. I think we have everybody getting situated. We have a few more people popping in. Just wanted to welcome everyone. Um, we did a reading last week as we're trying to come up with ways to entertain everyone from home. Um, and this week, we're going to do the first part of a lecture series. Um, today, we're going to be discussing what does a director do? And we have our producing artistic director, Roy Steinberg, who will be here to um, talk about that. Um, first things first, if you have any questions throughout the lecture today, if you could use the chat feature. Um, there's a couple of us under the Kate May Stage account, and um, we can relay the questions to Roy later on, or we can unmute you at the end so you can ask them yourselves if you like. Um, so first, I just want to introduce Roy. Uh, Roy, Roy Steinberg is our award-winning producing artistic director here at Kate May Stage. Um, the talk that he's going to be doing today grew out of a program he created as a special thank you for our producer circle. Uh, which is a group of our special supporters. Uh, Roy Steinberg has directed the majority of our productions over the past uh, decade and has been the artistic director of Theater Matrix in New York and the John Michael Kohler Art Center in Wisconsin. He has directed at regional theaters and universities all over the country um, and he has taught acting and directing at the university level as well as professionals in New York and Los Angeles. His MFA is from the Yale School of Drama. So Roy, um, would you like to start off by just talking to us about why you um, decided to speak to the producer circle about what a director does? Thank you, Mitchell. I'm, am I seeing? Am I seeing? I'm seeing you still. Do I, do I get to see myself or not? That's okay. Uh, hello, everybody, and uh, and welcome. You no, know, the producer circle started because um, a very intelligent. Uh, well-traveled theater goer, somebody who's quite sophisticated, said to one of our guest directors, um, I love the production I, I saw and it was so beautifully acted and everything about it was great and it was really well directed. And then stopped and said, well, actually, I'm not sure what that means. What does a director do? That's a very good question. So we had a small group of our producer circle and I talked a little bit about what a director does. And, in the slightly glib one word answer is everything. Uh, a slightly longer answer in one sentence is the writer, the playwright is the author of the words and the director is serving the playwright and is the director of the production. So what I mean by that is every single thing that happens from the second you walk into a theater is a director's choice. I was very, very lucky in my career. I started off as an actor and got to work with some of the world's greatest directors, uh, Marshall Mason at Circle Rep, who directed all of Lanford Wilson's plays on Broadway, uh, was, is a mentor of mine. Uh, John Madden, who directed Shakespeare in Love, the, the film was, um, and directed me on Broadway in a play called Wings, is a mentor of mine. And I got to learn and steal from them things that really worked. And occasionally I worked with people who weren't so great. And I thought, well, at least I could do that. And so that started me off on my directing career. But let's talk about this first second you walk into a, a theater. Long time ago, I did a play called Zex, Z-E-K-S. That's the Russian word for a political prisoner. And the director decided, working with the set designer, that he wanted the audience to feel like they were in prison with these political prisoners. So the audience sat on benches and it looked as if, once the audience was all seated, that they were locked in. They weren't really locked in because of the fire code, but there was a fence around the entire audience and locks were clicked shut, fake locks, and the lights went out and there was dogs barking and lights, flashlights, and it was kind of scary. And so before the play even began, you knew what world you were in. When we did a play here uh, at Cape May Stage, it took place on an oyster boat. I had to think, well, what do I want the audience to feel when they first walked in? Do we play music? Oftentimes we will play music that's related to the theme of the play. If it's a 1940s romantic play that takes place in New York, perhaps we may play uh, music from the 1940s that deals with love affairs and deals with New York. But in this case, the play about the oyster boat, from the moment the, the audience walked in, 
we had the sound of water lapping. Uh, we had the sound of creaks, the way a boat creaks when it's at the dock. Uh, that is a decision that the director makes, even in terms of the lighting. When you walk in, are the house lights up full? Or are they, is it difficult to even find the seats? Is it really dark? Depending upon light, depend, makes you feel a different way. If light is very, very dim, this is just uh, something that happens scientifically, we find that people whisper. You know, have you ever walked into the library and all of a sudden, for no reason, nobody tells you to be quiet, but you just know to be quiet? So there are certain lighting uh, elements, certain set elements that from before you even start, the audience is put into a certain world. In fact, this is a fun kind of exercise. You don't have to do it, but if you choose to, I'm going to let each of you who is listening here, uh, think of something that you want to accomplish and just tell me what happens. You can just write an email to me, Roy at KateMayStage.org, and I will respond to you. I'll just tell you, this is what I get. Not good or bad, this is what I get. So for example, let's say I'm just making this up here on the spot, but let's say you walk into a theater and you see a barbed wire, no, no curtain, just a stage and there's barbed wire and you think, oh, it must be something to do with war or camp or something. And you're sitting there and you're looking at your program, the lights go down. When the lights go down, you hear the sound of a wind chime. Now I'm surprised, wind chime and barbed wire, wind chime feels kind of delicate and, and nice, maybe Asian. I'm not really sure where I am yet. The lights come up and I see a figure huddled way upstage can't tell if it's a man or a woman. And very, very slowly the figure emerges from their huddle and I realize it's a little girl. And she's walking towards the barbed wire and she comes to the edge of the stage and she thrusts out her hand and in her hand is a, a piece of paper and she says, you came. That's the end of the exercise. As soon as somebody speaks, the exercise is over. So you tell me, what your exercise, what your, what your play is. It could be an already existing play. Let's say you want to do the Scottish play. You call, for those of you who are in the theater, Macbeth, you have to spit and turn around three times when you say Macbeth. But um, if you want to tell me how your Macbeth would begin, starts with the witches, um, what set would it look like? What sound effects? Or you might just walk into a theater and there's a curtain and there's nothing else but that. So the director is fairly new onto the scene of the theater. In the old days, the very beginning of theater, I'm gonna put on my theater history hat for a very short time. I, I've taught two semesters of this, but I'm gonna do it in like under three minutes. In the beginning, when we had Aeschylus and we had Agamemnon and the libation bearers and the humanities, it's very likely that Aeschylus himself taught the chorus, uh, their movements. Uh, we know this, there's a book by Dr. Nogler called A Source Book of Theatrical History. If you want to go further and take that out of the library, very interesting book. Uh, later on, after the Greeks and there were the Romans, then we had in, in the Middle Ages, um, really almost like community theater. There were groups of, of like unions and all of the, the shoemakers would get together and they would do a little mystery play, a medieval mystery play, usually you know, dealing with some aspect of the, uh, of the Bible. And from there, um, we, I'm just skipping way ahead. We had actor managers, people like David Garrick, who was stars and said, you know what? Um, I'm, I'm the star and I'll also tell everybody else where to walk and what to do. Um, and usually because they were stars, they were the ones upstage, everybody faced them. Upstage meaning people, they were towards the back and everybody else turned their back to the audience to look at them and basically threw lines to the stars. Uh, it changed over the years. And finally, a man, Stanislavski, you may have heard that name, um, said, you know, you can turn your back to the audience and try to make things more realistic. But here's an interesting story. My wife is a, stun a student of, of Russian and she told me the story, which I, I always loved, that supposedly during the Seagull, um, Stanislavski, was directing a rehearsal and Chekhov came and people were banging 
to themselves like this and, and check us, oh my God, what, why are they doing that? And, and Stanislavski said, well, we're by the lake. And so, you know, there's all these insects by the lake. And Chekhov said, well, if they don't stop doing that, I'm going to write a line. Funny, no, no bugs. Here we are by the lake, but there are no bugs. So from the very beginning, we had actors, directors, playwrights, in the best of worlds, all trying to go in the same direction. Um, there are tools that the director uses. The most important one is casting. You know, there's an old aphorism that casting is 90% of directing. It's a very important decision. Perhaps the most important decision a director makes is what actor is going to play what part. And usually directors have an idea of what they're looking for, though I on purpose try to open my mind. I know some given circumstances although these days even given circumstances are not necessarily followed. I mean, these days gender bending is happening and so uh, we have characters who, who may be not written to be in a wheelchair, like most recently in the Oklahoma, we had an, a character in, in a wheelchair. Um, I on purpose try to open my mind so that I'm thinking, well, you know, I was thinking that it should be played by someone who looks this particular way but this actor changed my mind. They brought something into the audition room. And now I'm thinking, well, what if I did that? And of course, there's what we call sometimes stunt casting, where you will either have a, um, a star who is going to play a major role or the opposite of what, what one might think. For example, Mother Courage, usually played by a big woman who carries a wagon through the Hundred Years' War, played by Bertolt Brecht. Um, there was a production where Linda Hunt, very diminutive actress, played that role, the opposite of what one might think. So we just recently had a production of Cyrano de Bergerac, and uh, Cyrano is known to be a great swordsman, and people make fun of the fact that he has a large nose. Well, he was played by a character, an act, a wonderful actor who was a dwarf. Now you might say, well, how come nobody, makes, nobody mentioned the fact that he's short? Director, I didn't see that production. I heard it was wonderful. I and mean, he's a terrific actor. So uh, the, the director of that particular production thought, well, I'm going to bring some new element into that. Uh, we have, of course, uh, the set design and the lighting design. And all of those things are from before the play even begins, directors are in conferences with those designers. So for example, when I first came to Cape May stage, I got an email out of the clear blue sky from a guy who, and uh, his name is Sean Fisher. He's also a playwright. But at the time he said, I wanna direct, I wanna uh, design the entire season for you. And I said at the time, well, let's try one. And if we fall in love with each other, we'll do some more. And so he designed a proof play that deals with mathematics and somebody, a girl whose father is a mathematician and we find out is dead and she's having some um, mental issues. And uh, he asked me what the set should be and I just, given circumstances, it says it's a, it's a, a, a craftsman style house on Lake Michigan. And so he sent all sorts of photographs and we decided on one house that we thought was right. And he designed a beautiful set that we'd never seen before at Cape May stage. I mean, it was the second story, which we never used, actually went through the grid, through the roof of the theater. And people went, oh my God. When I first saw the set, though I loved it, I said, you know, it's too, it sounds funny to say, but too realistic. I wanted something more abstract. I wanted something that was a metaphor for the play. And so what Sean did was he took the siding of that particular house and he put mathematical equations all over it. You know, cosine this plus that equals that. And that really did the trick. Now it was no longer a, just a realistic house and elements of realism, but it was a metaphor. In fact, that same man, Sean Fisher, in another production called A Walk in the Woods, um, we needed the woods, but we didn't feel we could do woods very well. And so Sean, with again, a really wonderful director, not me, um, actually it was Marlene Lustig, and they decided on taking the woods 
and making it look as if it was documents that had been through a shredder. So instead of having trees, they were long documents that uh, were both either, this is the former Soviet Union or, or American uh, diplomats who were arguing over a, um, an arms treaty. That kind of work is what a director brings to it. So we all know that at the end of the day, we're really all about storytelling. Again, true story. We did a play at Kate, at Kate May stage called um, Other Desert Cities. And when I announced I was doing it, a patron who I know and I love said, oh, I saw that play somewhere else and I hated it. In fact, I walked out at intermission. Uh, I said, really, what, what didn't you like about it? And she said, oh, it was just boring and it was all about politics and Anyway, that same person came back to see the production we did and thought we had changed the text. We hadn't changed a syllable of the text. The difference is that the other production, and it might have, I didn't see it, so I don't know whether it just didn't, wasn't a cup of tea for those particular people or not. But what we did, the very first thing I said to my cast was we need to create a family. And in families, there are family jokes, people. And so the first few days we imitated each other. I just did almost like, um, like a Pied Piper where people would walk around the, the stage and the children would ape their parents. And I think that happens in real life. You know, you say, oh, you have so-and-so, you have your mother's smile or your, your father's eyes or your father's uh, gesture. So the play began um, with people having come from the tennis, coming to play tennis. And so this is not in the script, but what I asked for was off stage to hear a huge laugh as if somebody had done, either told a joke or, or pushed somebody or something was funny. And so they come on immediately laughing. And so we get from the get go, this is a group of people who like each other, who make fun of each other, the way in families, brothers tease each other and sisters tease each other. So that gave an entirely different spin on that particular production. Um, you know yourselves, you know, if anybody has a, a bunch of details of a story, this happened and that happened and that happened, one person can tell that story and it will be very funny. Somebody else will tell the same story and it will seem mysterious. And somebody else will tell that story and it will be sexy. Now it all has to do with the way you tell the story. In fact, one of my jobs over the years, in addition to being a theater director, I'm also involved in television and film. And I was the guy uh, in for several television shows who directed all of the screen tests. Uh, they, because I came from the theater, uh, the producers of, at the time thought, well, I'd be good working with actors. And here's a great example of what I'm talking about. I would tell six actors the exact same blocking, the exact same camera angles, everything. And just what I described, one person would make it funny and somebody else would make it sexy and somebody else would make it scary. Um, I was directing that same, that very scene. And I said at one, this was a soap opera. So at one point a guy grabs a girl and she says, take your hands off me. And this is a soap, so it's romantic, back before the Me Too movement. And he says, okay, we'll just sit down and listen. And they have a really romantic moment with each other. And I said, even though you're saying, take your hands off me, that it's not a violent, take your hands off me, but sort of playing the opposite. So it's not clear to the other character what, he, what to do. And most of the actors did that, except one. And this one actress, when he put his hands on her, he said, get your hands off me. He said, okay, okay. And he played the scene entirely differently. Well, she didn't get the part, but six months later, when we were playing, we were casting a different character, somebody who was kind of an ax murderer. Uh, I said, remember that girl? <laughs> we don't need to do a screen test. Let's just hire her. And we did. Uh, the, the happy story is her name was Cynthia Watros and she won an Emmy Award and then later was on Lost. 
and has had a wonderful career. Uh, very powerful actress and a very strong actress. Couldn't play vulnerable at that moment, for in that, at that particular time in her career, but she could play strong and a little bit crazy. So that's the kind of thing a director does talking to, to actors. This is something that, is, that it may surprise you. The first thing I think it, uh, it, my job is as a director is to sell the play to my team, to my actors and to my designers. Now you might think, well, you have to sell it. They got the job. They're probably already on board. And yes, that's true. But everybody in the beginning is scared. No matter how big a star you are and how many plays you've done or movies you've done, and everybody wants to be reassured that this, this project is good. First of all, it's gonna be good, that the guy in charge knows what he's doing and is going to protect you. So the first job I have is at the very beginning, when we get together, I let the set designer, because we've already talked, talk about the set and they say, oh wow, it's a really interesting thing and it moves and it does that. And, and depending upon the play, all these little tricks happen and surprises happen. And then a costume designer will have renderings of the costumes and the actor sees that and says, oh, look how good I'm gonna look. And they've already built the, you know, this, so I'm, it's already in process. And the props are there. At Cape May stage, day one, we have everything, props, sound. Uh, right, right after the read through, we sit around the table for a little teeny bit, but then we go right into blocking. Uh, we just don't have time for long. I know there are some places and some directors who like to sit at the table and talk for sometimes weeks at a time. In academia, that's often the case. Um, we just simply can't. We, we open in two weeks. So, uh, so we don't do that. But once I've sold this piece, and here's I'm kind of showing my hand a little bit, no matter what project it is, I also have to turn myself on. And so whatever play I'm doing is the most wonderful play I've ever done at, at that moment. And I really genuinely believe it. So it's the most wonderful play because it's the world premiere. It's a, a new play. And I see that um, Chuck Everett is, is on, and, and I see Ed Shakespeare is, is there as well, two writers and others, I'm sure. Um, we've done new plays of Chuck Everett and, and, and others. Um, hi, I see, I see him saying, hello, Roy. Hi, Chuck. Um, we're so excited when we get to do a new play. So when I can tell everybody, this is the first time we've, these words have ever been said, you are creating it. We have a responsibility to make sure that this play has a life and that continues after, after us, and they always have. Um, or it might be that this is a play that is um, a, a musical. We don't generally do musicals. And so isn't this exciting that we've got music in it? Or we've got this wonderful uh, you know, Tony Award winning actor in it, or whatever it is. But I find something to, to get really excited by. Um, I talk about sound a lot because um, it's an, a very, very important element. I find that sound, although we don't often think about it, completely changes our experience. For example, if just looking at a, an apartment, an interior set, if you can hear a siren outside the window, that automatically, at least for me, because having lived through 9-11, whenever I hear sirens and I'm looking at something in New York, I immediately go back there and I get a little scared. I get a little uncomfortable. Or if you hear a dog barking, or if you hear a baby crying, or if you hear just pigeons, uh, on the window. Each of these things gives you an, a window into where we are, what kind of apartment it is. So one of the words you'll hear me say, and I'm not alone in this, is to be specific. And what I mean by that is a general way of thinking about something is you can say, oh, this character is a doctor. Well, therefore, you know, doctors do X, Y, and Z. But there are all kinds of doctors. You know, there are doctors who are very serious and doctors who are pranksters. Uh, there are, so you, you need to be specific. And in, and in terms of learning about um, an, an atmosphere that gets created, my second job, mm -hmm. after having 
told people or, or sold the play is creating the atmosphere for that production. Now, there was a production of The Royal Hunt of the Sun, which was a play about uh, Pizarro, the Spanish conquistador, and uh, his conquering of the Inca king, Huatapulpa. Uh, did I say it right? Can't remember. Anyway, um, the way they rehearsed it was the Spanish conquistadors never met the actors playing the Incas until like tech rehearsal. And so they were really, when the Spanish conquistadors saw these guys in you know, feathers and, and with all this gold, it really was like they were looking at people from another planet. Uh, and they didn't socialize. The cast, they, they would hang out, the, the conquistadors would hang out and the Incas would hang out, but they didn't socialize with each other. It just, because they didn't rehearse with each other. That's such an important thing. Oftentimes, I said you know, earlier that I, I tried to create a family for one particular play. Um, mostly what I tried to do is create an atmosphere where people feel safe, where nobody's gonna make fun of you if you fail, uh, where people are encouraged to take risks. And sometimes an actor will do something in a scene and it won't work. And I'll say, you know, it doesn't work there, but why don't we try something like that at the end of the play or try something at the, at the beginning of the play. And by rehearsing in that way, you discover moments. In fact, I'll just give you a, a quick example and then I'll maybe turn it over to, to questions. But one of the uh, experiences I've had when I was an actor was I was working on a play, it was called Terra Nova. And it was a play about uh, Robert Scott going to Antarctica. And in this play, he's haunted by Amundsen, the Norwegian explorer who beat him to the South Pole. And in the play, Amundsen haunts uh, Scott. I've done this particular play many times. I was in play when it was first done at Yale and I did it again in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and in Kentucky, and the Actors Theater of Louisville, and anyway, a bunch of different places. Um, in one production, I shared a dressing room with uh, one actor, and I shared a house with another, and they hated each other. I mean, they had completely opposite ways of working. One was a kind of a star, he was British, and uh, he was playing Robert Scott. And he would say to me, you know, I know this other guy is a friend of yours, but do you realize that yesterday before he said the line, he kissed me on the cheek. The, you know, the day before that, he whispered in my ear. Today, he slapped me across the face. He said, now, I, mean, I've been tr I tried to talk to him to no avail. Could you help me? And I would go to my friend and I would say, you know, what, what's up? What, what, what are you doing? Uh, I mean, it wasn't my business. I was just an actor. It wasn't, but he said, well, you know, this guy, I'm trying to keep the thing alive. I'm trying to haunt him. And no matter what I do, he says his line the same way. <laughs> so I realized that instructed me because what it said to me was the director never was specific enough, although he's a wonderful director at that moment, he, specific enough about the nature of the haunting. If you can slap someone, and you can kiss them in the same moment, it's a different moment. So all of those things were good choices that should have been done in rehearsal. And along the way, the director should have said, let's go with the whisper, or let's go with the slap or the kiss or whichever one worked for that particular production. So it's so important that people get on the same page. I'll, I'll give you one last one and then we'll open it up. And that was, I did a, a really interesting play. It was called Women Beware Women uh, by Howard Barker, who is a contemporary British playwright. It was done off Broadway. And again, we had an amazing cast of all Broadway actors, experienced actors. And I was astounded at the dress rehearsal when um, one of the, I was on stage with another actor and the actors stopped dress rehearsal, which you never do and said to the director out in the house, um, excuse me, uh, we're supposed to cross left, aren't we? And the director said, yes. 
And he said, well, I'm, I'm having a problem. He said, well, what's the problem? He said, he won't come. <laughs> the other actor would not come. He said, what do you mean he won't come? And the other actor with this big Broadway voice said, I'm perfectly willing to cross down left. It's the Duke who will not be pulled. And so again, I realized these were actors, terrific actors, but the idea of somebody who felt he was royalty and this other character was pulling him, he was not gonna go with that. I understand that. They needed a director to say, don't pull him. I understand what you're trying to do. You need to find some other way to get him down left. And ultimately they did. Um, I thought maybe now we can open it up and we can talk a little bit about um, you know, uh, some questions or, or thoughts that people might have. Mitchell? Sure. Um, I know I wanted to ask you a question that I know that I think people will be interested in is the positive kind of relationship between a director and a playwright. And what comes to mind since Charles Edwards here, we love Charles, um, the intermission of an actor's carol, how that kind of came from a director playwright kind of relationship, which um, I think helped both sides of it. So um, if you want to talk about that a little bit, I thought that would be great to share. Thank you, Mitchell. That's a great idea. Uh, Charles Everett wrote a play uh, called An Actor's Carol, which was like a Christmas carol, um, but it was a, instead of Scrooge, it was an actor who was playing Scrooge, who was kind of burned out, and, um, and the, instead of the, the ghosts of Christmas past and so on, we had the, the ghost of ushers past and critics and so on. It was very funny, kind of a parody and um, beautifully written, and it was a great success for us. Uh, at Cape May Stage, just uh, the, the fact that it was a play that was a little bit long to sit in one for our, our audience. Our audience is mainly people who are over 60. And I just said to Chuck at one point, you know, I just know that once we get around this page, they're gonna start getting up and going to the bathroom. And the way our theater is uh, situated, it ruins the play. It means people get up and they have to go up the, the main aisle. And Chuck is such a wonderful person to work with, so easy and, and, and um, accessible. And I, and I had an idea. I said, well, why don't we, why don't we take this moment when they had one of the, the, usher, the usher of Christmas past, um, who uh, this is kind of a perfect spot to tell people, I'm the, he's the usher, you say, you know what, I'm gonna call an intermission here. <laughs> and uh, Chuck ended up liking that. And I think actually wrote it into the play for subsequent production. Maybe uh, he, he can talk about that if he's, if, that's a, if he's available to do that. Oh, he's muted, I'm afraid, he says. <laughs> Hello, can you hear me? Hey, Riz. Hi, there Chuck. You go. Man, how are you? This is a terrific talk. <laughs> Thank you. Actually, and um, yeah, that was a great idea, uh, the idea of having an intermission. It was actually the element that we most need, that the play most needed. As you remember, Roy, it's not something I thought about doing until I got in there and you were, um, had rehearsed it, and I could never find an end point, <clears throat> excuse me, and, and it was such a great idea to give the audience a little breath. It wasn't just that, as you said, it's a, it's a practical thing. It's a theater goer thing as well, but it, that play needed a breath for people to re-catch themselves and say, oh, this is fun, but I want now to have a break and come back and enjoy what ended up being a better second act. So that was a real organic and natural way to discover that. And that was a, you know, that's one of the reasons why I feel so lucky to do my plays at your theater and with you is because it's a process of discovery, you know, and, and that really is great for a playwright. So I, I couldn't be more happy with it. Well, thank you. That's a wonderful window into the process. And, um, and the same thing has happened with people, um, other playwrights, we've done several productions of Sean Fisher. I don't think he's with us. But with Sean too, before the play even gets into rehearsal, uh, very mm -hmm. often I'll read the play and make suggestions and, and you know, never, do I dictate anything? That's not my right. The play, and this is just a legal thing as well, the play belongs to the playwright. Right. Uh, unlike film and television, Chuck knows about that because he's been involved in that world too. Um, in film and television, uh, in fact, I am a member of unions to write because in a soap opera, if a show is too short, we just 
write something right there. I mean, just make something up. That's not even be good. Just give me, I need 90 seconds of, of, of something. Um, so the, the sponsor owns that intellectual property, but in a play, as a member of the Dramatist Guild, the playwright owns the intellectual material. I'm always very cognizant of that. And, uh, and so I might suggest uh, that we need something here or something isn't clear. Uh, we had a, a production where it just, I, I didn't know what happened. And I, you know, I mean, I know what happened because I've read it 18 times um, and, I, and I directed it. But I said, you know, I, as an audience member, and I try to give myself a, a blank, you know, I, I, on purpose, try to come in blank. I said, I'm not sure what she did. And so the playwright went back and tried to make it clear. Now, sometimes you don't want to make it crystal clear because I've had that experience as well. In fact, there was a production, again, I was an actor in this called Cradles, and it was a very poetic play by Ana Casio. And uh, in, in development and in workshops, people kept saying, I didn't get this and I didn't get that. And so she fixed it. And in fixing it, in my opinion, uh, kind of took out all the poetry because now we literally know what happened, but I didn't want to necessarily know. So it's, it's up to a playwright to protect his work and working with an act, a director that you trust, know that a director who you trust is on your side and is not just trying to you know, make it a, you know, a hallmark TV series. Roy, um, Heidi had a question as well, which kind of follows up with what we're discussing right now. Um, Heidi was curious about how do you feel about playwrights that direct their own plays? Well, I think some playwrights direct, direct their own plays very well. I mean, Chuck Edwards is a good example of it. He's, a, he's directed his own plays with great success. Um, I think some playwrights, I mean, David Mamet directs a lot of his own plays. Uh, some playwrights, it can only be as good as it is in their head, as it is in their imagination. And so I think for sometimes the reason a playwright, I mean, I, we could go back to Chuck and ask him as well, uh, might prefer a director, if he could, tr again, trust the director, is that the d director comes at it from yet another sensibility and maybe informs it in a way that makes it even better. Um, nothing wrong with a playwright directing, and it's certainly better than having a director ruin your play. <laughs> you know, you got to a playwright and somebody's going to just destroy it. No, and go and direct it yourself. Thank you. Hi, did you have like, any other questions? Um, any follow-up? No, I was going to say, just to get <laughs> back on that for a second, I feel the same thing is true with designers. For example, um, I have an idea about a design, but it's never as good as somebody who is a professional designer. So I might say to, a, you know, I don't, I don't want to design the set for them. I'll say, this is what I need. I need to be able to do X, Y, and Z, and I need it to change really quickly. And then the designer will come up and say, have you ever considered this? Or, you know, does it have to be realistic? And I'll say, no, it doesn't. Well, how about if we never even saw the wall? Yeah, I never thought of that. Great. And so it's better than I thought it was going to be. And I think occasionally that's true for, for, for playwrights. But I have you know, enormous respect for writers. And, and um, in the best of, of all worlds, a dramaturg, a playwright, and a director all get together and feed each other to make it better than the, the sum is better than the sum of its parts. The whole is better than the sum of its parts. My opinion. And um, Charles actually had a question about, um, Denise, do you want to unmute Charles real fast? Unmute Charles. I can, oh, there we go. Oh, there. Can you hear me again? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, Roy, it was just, I was always curious. I never asked you, you're a very talented actor as well as a director. How does being an actor inform the way you work as a director? That's a great question. Uh, it informs it enormously. Uh, I never think, I have different parts of my brain. I, I don't act for my, when I'm directing. I, I don't say I would do it like this. In fact, I encourage actors to come up with their own performance. I'll never ask an actor to do something I know can't be accomplished. Uh, and you know, very rarely, but once in a while, 
You know, someone said, oh, I just can't do it. In fact, this is not a technical thing, but at one point we were doing a Christmas, different Christmas show, and uh, a wonderful actor uh, doing a one-man version of uh, this wonderful life. And I had a snow machine going, and a poor guy, you know, he was up there screaming his lungs out. And he said, I can't do it over, over this. I have no breath and I can't do it. And I said, yes, you can. And I did it. I just got up and I said, and I, I didn't do that for him. I just did Richard III. I got up and I said, now is the winter of our discontent made glorious summer by this. You know, and he said, okay, okay, I can do it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the, the Subins have some uh, question as well. Denise, if we could unmute them. There we go. Go ahead. Hi, Roy. It's great hey. having you over for dinner. <laughs> great to see you guys. Um, how do you deal with an actor who just won't receive your directions or you know, feels like they know what, how to do it themselves? That's a great question. Um, usually, if an actor is being really um, uh, not wanting to receive what you're, you're, you're giving them, they usually, e either they're afraid, they're scared they can't do it, so they only can do their, their version of it, so part, so part of my job is to say, you know what, we can always do what you said. We can always go back to that. So it's not a fight. It's not like it's my will over your will. I said, but just as an experiment, let's see what happens if we do it, even though it's stupid. I mean, I know it's stupid, but let's just try it this way. Um, at the end of the day, if somebody just won't do anything you tell them to do, you may have to just recast. I mean, if it's really inappropriate. I've, I've never had that happen, but... Sometimes you just, you know, if, if somebody, something happens, you know, along the way where they just say, I'm, I'm not, I'm just not going to listen to anything you say. Then somewhere along the way, you've lost respect. They've lost respect for you. And you may have to sit down and say, you know, what is it? I mean, I'm not saying I'm right all the time, I, but I, I have an idea of what I'm trying to do here. And you're fighting me on every single one of these things, you know, help me help you. <laughs> Great program. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. I believe up next we have a question from Ken Kirby. If Denise could make some technological magic happen for me. While Denise is getting Ken lined up, um, something when we did this at the producer circle that I thought was really amazing was you talked a little bit about the play we were doing at the time, which was Sidekicked, and how different your view of a lot of the moments was compared to what was on the page. Um, I, don't re I don't think a lot of the audience really knew how much direction went into Sidekicks. That really kind of threw that play over the top, in my opinion. Um, it was great on paper, but I, the direction of that play in particular made it a spectacle. Do you want to just discuss that a little bit about, you know, some of that inspiration? Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I love the text, I, and I thought that, you know, Kim did such a wonderful job. And I later found out, I didn't know this initially, but it was actually Samuel Beckett that inspired him to write that play. And ironically, it was a play that we had done, a play called Happy Days, which was the most controversial play we'd ever done at Cape Mid Stage. Uh, but there was a bleakness and Vivian Vance, uh, it wasn't all you know, sweetness and light. And I think a lot of people came thinking it was gonna be I Love Lucy and, and fun. And it was at times, but there was something very, very strong, an underlying current of, of struggling with her identity and something that had, it was more, that had, there was more stuff underneath it. And when I spoke with the actress, and there's a good example of the earlier question, uh, Sally Mays was just terrific to work with. And I, again, Tony Award nominee, who's, got, who's worked with all kinds of major people. And certainly she would have the right to say, well, who the hell are you to tell me? Uh, but never did, and, and was was willing always to try anything I asked her to do. And so we got to a, a very kind of raw and special place. And even the blocking, you know, it's so interesting where you put an actor. Uh, just a tiny thing, like if somebody goes further upstage or comes downstage, changes the power dynamic. And so sometimes I'll play around with that as well. And the, you know, sometimes someone will ask, you know, when you've done a high school play, you'll get those Samuel French acting editions and it will say, you know, they rise and they cross left and they sit here and so on. 
And uh, they said, well, what do you need your director for? Couldn't you just do what, you know, what that says? And yes, you could. There's a difference between what the writer writes. If a writer has written pause, to me, that's sacrosanct. It, it, there's a reason the writer wrote pause. But oftentimes in those Samuel French acting editions, a stage manager did what the first production did. So if the actor sat at that moment, he writes, sits. And if he got up at that moment, which was perfect in that production, he says, rises. Now, we may have a very different production, perhaps a better one, just because it was on Broadway doesn't mean that it was better, that we have more money than we do. But, but um, so we want to rediscover it. In fact, here's a great example of someone who asked me before um, about working with somebody who was difficult. This man wasn't difficult, but it was Ben Hammer. <clears throat> we did a play called Visiting Mr. Green. And Mr. Green was an 89 year old Jewish shut in. And I didn't know it at the time, but he had done the play previously and he'd won an award for doing it in Colorado. <clears throat> and when I told the playwright that I cast him, the playwright said, I hate that guy. I said, what? <laughs> what do you hate him? He's a great actor. And he said, he ruined my play, didn't he? And I said, what do you mean? And he said, oh, he did all kinds of stupid shtick. He won some bull, excuse my French, but, you know, bull award and, and um, you know, but it wasn't my play. And I said, well, like, why? And he said, well, he would scratch his butt and do you know, stuff the audience would laugh. But so I said, I promise you, he won't do that. Well, as we get through rehearsal, every time he started to do something, um, he said, I have an idea. I get this itch. And I said, well, wait, wait, wait. I know that you've done this before and you know you got a great laugh, but let's start anew. Let's see, let's just strip it away. And he says, no, it works, it's great. I said, no, we can always put it back. Let's just do it without it. And I kept <clears throat> taking things away from him to the point he was getting really frustrated. And he said, you're taking away all the good stuff. And when we, when we did the play, the playwright came and the playwright said, I've seen 30 productions of this, of my play all over the world. This is the best production I've ever seen. And then you were terrible in Colorado. What happened? <laughs> he actually said that to him. And I laughingly said, I told him not to scratch his butt. <laughs> but what it was, was he finally had, he, he had trust. He saw that what he had done previously was a different style of production. Again, not better or worse, but it was a very broad, production where people were going for easy laughs. You can always get a laugh. I mean, you drop your pants and get a laugh. The question is, do you want a laugh like that? Or do you want something that has more validity to it? So I have a higher you know, value system, to be frank, and I want the laugh to come out of character and out of situation. Hi, Ken, I see you there. Hi, Roy, how are you? Good. Good to see you. Uh, I've got two questions. The first one's really elementary, and that is, do directors ever participate in the auditioning process and the selection of actors? And then the second question is, when you decide what director you're going to bring on board, sort of what are your criteria? What are you thinking about? Those are great questions. The first one is, yes, absolutely, entirely. Um, the director is uh, completely uh, cast the play. And if it's a guest director, and I think that's what you're really asking, does that director have any choice in casting his actors? Yes. Um, I'm involved in every element as a, this is now as a producer, as the producing artistic director. Um, when we did, for example, the play that we did this, this past Christmas, um, Murder for Two, the holiday edition, we had a terrific guest director come in um, and he hired one man who had done the play previously, and another who had not, who was a terrific actor, but when we got him here, we realized that he wasn't up to it. He just couldn't learn it quickly enough, and, we had, and I fired him, I was, you know, broke my heart. And he was you know, sweet as could be about it. He said, no, you're right, I just, I thought I, I could do it and I can't. And so we brought in somebody again. Uh, so this is a casting choice of, um, of what needed to be done at that particular point. So, uh, that's what I do in terms of casting with a guest director. I, I give the director a lot of leeway. If they do something I think is really going to be a problem, I'll voice it. I'll say, I'm, I mean, I'll let you, you know, use her or him, but I'm just looking at the resume and they've never 
played anything other than you know a spear carrier before in anything professional you know they've they've done stuff at school but never anything other than that so you're taking a you know a bit of a risk uh just so you know that but and typically so they would join you in new york for the audition yeah. if that's where you're auditioning exactly exactly I and sometimes if they're not in new york we'll do it video wise when we did uh -huh. liner in winter uh the director of that particular production was in north carolina and so sometimes actors would send i would say this is my cast if i were going to cast this this is who i would cast and uh he would and it, here's a good example the guy playing richard i was going to cast the guy who was uh, max who had played in billy bishop goes to war to play Richard the Lionhearted. And he said, you know, he's a good actor and he's sweet, but he's sweet. I need somebody who's a killer. Uh, and I said, you're right, you're right. And so we ended up casting the guy who we, we ended up using, who in real life was a lovely, kind person, but looked like he could be a killer. Uh, and so, we, and he was a better choice. So, um, so, and the way I choose directors is sensibility wise. I know, for example, that um, Hans, who directed the musical, had done a great many musicals with people I knew. Like in, in that specific case, he'd worked with Kim Zimmer and Robert Newman. Uh, and both of them had, you know, I talked to them about what his process was like. Uh, Marlena and I met with him in New York. We talked about uh, both Robert and, and Kim, who, I know intimately having worked with them on Guiding Light for you know, over 10 years and hearing his take, which was really interesting. I mean, from a directing perspective, the things that, you know, that were difficult, the things that worked, the things that didn't, I, I felt we spoke the same language. And he was a, just a, a good guy, a kind person. I mean, part of our core values at Cake May Stage is to treat people with respect. So, if there's somebody who has a reputation for being, you know, beating people up uh, metaphorically and, and uh, being, you know, uh, difficult and, and angry, that's not the guy I want or woman I want, even if they're a talented artist. So I want people who fit into our family at Cape May Stage, which means they're respectful, but really care about the work. I mean, one of the things I say, which is just obvious, is we, we don't have a lot of money. So... You know, we're paying people usually the union minimums. That's true for directors as well as actors. So the only thing we've got is the work. So it may as well be fabulous. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and so I want it to be the best it can possibly be. <clears throat> it can't just be a job. Like I need another job. Occasionally you get people, you know, who'll say that. They'll say, I just need something for uh, my health insurance or unemployment or, you know, something. Uh, I said, well, you're in the wrong you're in the wrong profession because you're not going to, you you're not going to get that here. <laughs> I need somebody who's passionate, who really wants to do it. And Thank has you. Friends. Yeah, welcome. Anybody else? I don't think we have any other questions. Um, I just wanted to personally thank everyone for joining us today. Um, I think it was really informative. I think the questions were fantastic. Um, it's a, like we said before, this is a new venture for us. I know the next um, session of the lecture series is going to be about casting. Um, as you, a lot of you know, Roy has background in not only um, theatrical casting, but also um, film and soap operas and, and things of that nature. So um, we were discussing how helpful it'll be for theater actors that are having to change their audition methods because now they're auditioning via Zoom and via you know, screens and things like that. Um, and that might not be part of their training. Um, we also have a reading next week. Um, we're going to be getting the info out soon. It is um, a song at Twilight, the Noel Coward play, um, one of the last plays he wrote. Very fascinating, very interesting. It'll be featuring Roy, Marlena. I think I'll be the stage directions and a little a little waiter of some sort, dropping off some drinks. Um, so you'll see all of our lovely faces, and we hope to see you there as well. Um, if you'd like to make a donation, uh, we have the link um, hopefully on this page and also on our website kitneystage.org. And if you are watching this after um, via just the stream or on YouTube and you have a question for Roy, um, like Roy said earlier, his email is roy at kitneystage.org. And we'd be more than happy to answer any questions you might have for him as well. Anything else, Roy? No, thank you all so much. This was fun. Wonderful.
Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you for joining us. And um, we'll look forward to seeing you for our future events. Stay safe and take care. Thank you.